This session is about Adhikara. Adhikara is qualification. For those wishing to prepare for liberation, they should be Adhikaris. It means you should be qualified. What are the qualifications? How does one become an Adhikari? These are important questions for those who seek to have freedom from suffering. So the first question, of course, is what is Adhikara? The difference between Indian tradition and many religions is that in this spiritual tradition, one does not really convert, not preach, nor force these ideas on anybody because it's based on the idea of qualification. The sages were firmly of the belief that when the student was ready, he would ask certain questions. He would start seeing things differently. And what are this, these questions or how does he start seeing the world? So the Adhikari is one who begins to feel I am bound, I should be liberated. He is living his worldly life as yet and he begins to feel that whatever he does, he feels trapped, he feels bound and he wants freedom. He also seeks something that is permanent. He loses interest in things that are transient and ever-changing. Most of us still enjoy to have pleasures, whether it is sexual pleasures, food, social pleasures, etc. And Adhikari begins to see in everything the transience of it. He begins to see that it's always changing and he begins to long for something that's permanent, something that is intransient. A very important criteria is that an Adhikari begins to see pain and suffering in all worldly life. For most people who are of a materialistic bent of mind, they enjoy worldly life. They are enjoying to have their wonderful possessions, their, their beautiful house and car and all these nice things, no doubt, very nice. But they begin to see pain even in these. It is said that such a person becomes so sensitive that his mind becomes as sensitive as the eyeball. I'm sure all of you have experienced this. The eyeball is so sensitive that even the slightest grain of dust goes into your eye. It, it irritates the eye so much that you cannot rest until it's out. You will drop everything and the only thing you want is to have that little speck of dust or grain of dirt which is in there, totally harmless, all the same. It bothers so much that you cannot rest until it's out. And that is how sensitive the mind of an Adhikari is. He cannot rest until he has overcome this suffering. 
And Adhikari also asks, what is happiness? What is suffering? It's an important question. Because most people are seeing suffering and happiness and they are seeing happiness and suffering. For example, we all know that there are joyous moments that people celebrate. If you get a promotion, you have a new member in the family, marriage, all these are events that are celebrated and you say, oh, that's happiness. But such a person begins to also see in these moments suffering. Don't get me wrong, this person, an Adhikari, is not a life-negating person. He's just beginning to see things differently. He's, he's not ignoring or shutting out that aspect of life that's, that is also painful. With a promotion may come more responsibilities or with marriage may come also a lot of difficulties initially. So he begins to ask himself, what is happiness and what is suffering? So this is a little bit about the character of such a person. <clears throat> so any questions at this point? Any comments? And in that case, I will continue. <clears throat> Please let me know if there's anything with the screen. Um, since we have restarted after the sabbatical, there have been some changes in Citrix Receiver, the, the, the program go to meeting. Uh, the screen appears a little different, and so... That's why I have um, <clears throat> Please let me know if there's any issues with the screen or readability. Okay. Um, a question from Shriram. How can the Adhikari... Um, conduct family life with such a mindset. Hmm. Maybe it's better to take that question a little later before we understand these qualities. All right. Um, for Beth, uh, first time I heard this as a statement of character, I'm familiar with more in the context of capacities. Well, her character is extremely important, so I don't know quite what you mean in terms of capacity, but as understood in the oral tradition, it's the most, the most important aspect is character. Just to give you an example, Beth, uh, imagine you have all the capacities. I'm not sure what you mean by capacities, but if you mean somebody who is healthy, intelligent, etc., I presume, um, but has a wrong character in the sense that he has not got high uh, values, ethic, high ethical standard. And such a person can misuse these high teachings and secret teachings which is also why the candidates who, who came to a master to this day are, are, are vetted very carefully. And a person of low character, poor character, would not be accepted or he has to develop 
his character and his personality before he's ready. Okay, so we continue then. Qualities of a genuine seeker or a adhikari. There are certain qualities that are very useful. One is that such a genuine seeker has already through keen observation and perhaps a few spontaneous spiritual experiences come to the conclusion that there is nothing permanent in this world and that everything is like an illusion because whatever we see is the result of the conditioning of our mind. To use a very simple example, two people can go to a, the same event or the same movie. One person would say that was a great movie and the other person would say that was terrible. The movie was the same or it's about a book. You can read the same book and one person will say that was a great book and the other one will say this is terrible because we perceive things differently. We have different experiences, we have different backgrounds, different talents, completely different way of seeing the world. So while any object would remain the same, each person colors this object differently. He perceives it differently, he sees it differently. So when he begins to recognize through keen observation or through some spontaneous spiritual experiences that the mind is conditioned, he is ready. Word of caution here, turning away from the world does not mean that this is now forced upon the self is a natural result of insightful observation. It's not escapism. It's not that you are become a seeker, seeking spiritual experiences or seeking the end of suffering merely because you want to escape from suffering, but because of your natural insights and keen observation you have begun to see the world differently. It's a far more positive approach to life rather than a negative because you begin to question, you begin to contemplate. You don't just accept things the way it is. You begin to question what I would say in inverted commas is the conventional wisdom of people. The path you choose, the kind of discipline you take up also depends on the intensity of these observations and experiences. <clears throat> and most important, this person is at the starting point of the internal journey. He is not an adept which means that every now and then you may fall back to worldly ways. The mind may forget, in inverted commas, forget momentarily those higher insights and may be caught up again in worldly matters and end up suffering. So the seeker needs First, validation of these insights. He asks himself, is this true? Is it true that everything is actually transient? And whatever truths he has discovered, he seeks validation for these. This validation must also come from different sources, not just from one. And each of these sources must confirm this, whether it's the teacher, it's the tradition, the scriptures, all these sources 
would confirm these insights. Give him the assurance that he is on the right track. So there are four basic criteria for the Adhikari. First is Viveka. Viveka means discrimination. That means such a person knows the difference between right and wrong. Now that may seem like a very um, ordinary sort of um, criteria. It is in fact extremely important. There are a lot of people who do not know the difference between right and wrong. Very often we lie, maybe small lies, nothing, no big lies, but all the same. We know it is wrong, but we still speak lies, even white lies. We do things that are maybe not right in terms of uh, behaving with people, behavior. We know certain behavior is not right, but we still do it. A simple thing like tax, for example. People try to cheat on taxes, you know, avoid paying taxes, and they do all sorts of complicated things. Things which are not okay, but it's somehow accepted by most people. So that clarity needs to increase. Another way of saying this is you need a very sharp buddhi. An adhikari has an extremely sharp buddhi. The second criteria is known attachment. Known attachment means already there is a certain significant development which has taken place, obviously through keen observation and certain spiritual experiences. And the person begins to realize that he should not get too hung up on certain ideas, needs to learn to let go of certain relationships or certain situations. This is the beginning of non-attachment, which eventually leads to the highest state of paramvairagya or witnessing. Third, a very important criterion is the intense desire to be liberated from suffering. This is like a longing. It's a very deep longing within. And I had mentioned the example of the eyeball. The yogi's mind becomes so sensitive. Like the, in the eyeball, this little grain which is disturbing you and you cannot rest until it's out. And so this intense desire is similar to this. You cannot rest. You must be liberated. There's a longing, there's a thirst, and that pulls you. When these three are present, it results in discipline, which in turn is firm abhyasa practiced over a long period of time. Discipline that's forced on anybody will not last, is not firm, it will not last for a longer period of time. Discipline or self-effort can only come out of having clarity of mind that this is the right thing to do, not to be attached to other things, making space for discipline, and having the desire to do discipline, to have that effort. Any questions so far? Uh, 
I, I have one small question. Yes. Uh, regarding the sources, uh, you mentioned that there are multiple sources from which this validation can come. Yes. So, is how does a seeker kind of be careful in some sense or discriminate that the source is the right source? So, of course, there in these days, information can come from anywhere and even even from inside ourselves, the information can come from the wrong part of our mind. So, mm. Yes, I mean, of course, that is a difficult matter. We look for somebody with authority. For example, if you want to buy a car and you look in the internet, you get some offers, maybe there are second-hand cars, you don't know how to buy a second-hand car because maybe you not everybody has got a experience in, uh, you know, understanding a car or unless you're a mechanic or something. But... For, for the average person, for a lay person, you don't know how to buy a second-hand car. So what do you do? You need somebody who maybe helps you, somebody who knows something about cars. You get an expert, a friend who perhaps knows a little bit more than you, and somebody you trust. Or you get an authority person, right? Such a person is an authority. So in all parts of our life, when you're not sure about something, you look for an authority. The authority is generally a teacher. The authority may be scripture. And of course, if you are right at the beginning of your search and you don't even have a teacher as yet, you don't have many options other than diving in at the deep end and finding out for yourself. Making mistakes is also one way of doing that. You go through certain experiences and you say, neti neti, that's what the sages said, neti neti, not this, not this. You go through a process of elimination and you try different teachers, different traditions, maybe even different religions, which a lot of people go through in this search. The search can become extended when there is not that much clarity. But the more intense the search, the more intense the desire, the longing, the greater it becomes, it is said that the teacher appears. When the student is ready, the teacher appears. When that longing is nurtured, then a teacher will appear. I know a lot of people tell me, oh, but I haven't found my teacher and there are not any good teachers and all of them are fake and they're all crooks and they want my money and things like that. And to that I can say, don't ask whether the teacher is good. Ask whether you are a good student. Work on yourself in whatever way you can. It may be something as simple as praying every day for guidance. So this validation comes from authority. It comes whether it is from a teacher, a tradition, or you have had certain experience and you read a book and you say, oh, that, that, that scripture described exactly what happened to me. That, that is, that's now in this Bhagavad Gita or in the Yoga Sutras. And then you say, okay, that was a valid experience. And if you are not even at that stage, all that remains is for you to keep having high character, prayer, and nurturing that longing. <clears throat> okay. That helps, thanks. Um, Beth asks, discipline, elaborate on discipline. Um, I, thank you for whoever was speaking before. It took me a moment to realize I could use the microphone. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I want to thank you for this, this session. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, it's the first time uh, what I'm loving is uh, your perspective on all this because uh, I am highly dedicated depth of longing and have been at this for yeah. probably 20 years but okay. um so 
discipline is always something that I um, would like to hear more about in the context of um, I'm a householder, I'm raising a son, you mm-hmm. know, I work full time, I'm getting a PhD, I um, uh, am highly disciplined in some regard, but recognize, um, I don't know if I have the question here exactly, it's, um, I think what I uh, would like to hear is, you had mentioned um, these three components really developing um, discipline. I'm dedicated and disciplined to a degree, um, but always seem to be looking for greater commitment for myself for maybe a little longer in the practice mm-hmm. or um, yeah. more consistent. So, no, I'm consistently inconsistent. So, <laughs> or I'm inconsistently consistent yeah. um, because of the nature of life, but I also recognize um, spiritual harmony, attainment, and freedom is integral yeah. in my life and lifestyle, but yeah, I don't know, hopefully that will give you a little bit of an idea. Mm-hmm. Yes, from what you described, Beth, it sounded like you're a very busy person. You're a householder, you are raising uh, your son, I think you said, and yeah, uh, you have a full-time job, so it requires a lot of management, time management and organization to maintain and sustain a sustain a practice over a longer period of time. I am not surprised that uh, you're having difficulties. We all lead pretty busy lives in our you know a modern way of living and raising a child or children and uh, hanging on you know to a, a full time job at the same time is very challenging so i would tell you what the oral tradition says and in my experience of over 25 years personally as well as well as with students it has worked very beautifully and that is to lower lower your expectations. We set our expectations too high. We are very, very harsh on ourselves. We condemn ourselves. And then we feel also, you know, um, the pressure. And um, what is useful instead of saying, let me do an hour every day or or four hours on the weekend or however it is that you plan it for yourself to make your discipline much more realistic. One of the things I tell the students who come to me right in the, you know, fresh and um, they have generally very high expectations from themselves, I say, It's okay even if you touch your mat, you know, your meditation seat, even that counts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have in our uh, tradition the practice of, of doing this four times a day. And I say it counts if you even touch your seat, meditation seat, or yoga mat, whatever you want to call it, four times a day. It even counts if you do it mentally, you know, touching the meditation seat in your mind, not even physically, you know, doing it. What happens with that is that four times a day, wherever you may be, you could be traveling and, you know, driving your car, though I don't advise as well as driving, but definitely, if you're, you know, in the, in the subway or you have an appointment with the dentist exactly at the time that you have to practice, you can sit there mentally, touch your meditation seat, or just do a simple little inner prayer for a minute, and that counts. What you will have achieved is that you will have done four times a day seven times a week 
which is already 28, and you do it a whole month, and you do that a whole year, and it's just one minute. But if you've done it one minute four times, every day in one week you have done half an hour, which makes it, you know, two hours in a month. And all you have to do is sustain that. Not to have very high expectations. And if you say four times one minute is, is not practical, then we say, okay, then just do morning and evening before you go to bed and after you get up in the morning. You have one minute each, five minutes each, but just do that every day. You have achieved something really great that you have sustained a practice over a longer period of time. It may sound to some people like, oh, but that's only half an hour a week, you know, but be realistic. You're a busy person. You have a lot of responsibility and you're caring for a child. So that's a very important job. So with this different perspective of looking at practice, you make things realistic, achievable. And I have seen amazing things happening to people who have just done a few minutes every day, but then sustain that for one year. And within one year, there was a noticeable difference. Does that help, Beth? Yes, tremendously. Yeah. Thank you. That's okay. um, uh, <laughs> it, it, it gives permission to find the balance that works best. Yes, yes, that's important. Stuart says, Veragya, complete non-attachment, is, I understand, quite an advanced stage. So I assume that it's beginning to develop this. Yes, this is not complete non-attachment. That's Param Veragya. We're talking about Veragya, which is a stage before. <clears throat> so I'll continue. Integration of spontaneous spiritual experiences. It's very likely that an Adhikari has arrived at these insights just by chance. It, it could be a very intense, uh, you know, life-transforming experience, sort of, you know, earth-shaking experience. It could be a milder, simpler kind of momentary experience. Just a little glimpse. It could just happen that you're walking one day and you see a beautiful sunset and something shifts in your mind and you ask yourself, what is the purpose of life? Why am I doing all this? Am I really happy? And something shifts and you set off on a journey seeking something higher, something more meaningful. There may be many such little momentary experiences. There may be deeper, more intense experiences by chance most of the time. Not everybody is doing practice, but for, for those who begin, begin generally because it happened to them. So these insights, whether they are spontaneous or if they are through practice, must be integrated and established. For this you need effort. There are three kinds of effort. First is knowledge of the scriptures. Because the scriptures are maps. They are maps that the, those who have traveled before us have left behind for us. So we have some guidance on this very um, difficult inner journey. 
what does happen unfortunately is that these maps or these scriptures are not understood very clearly because sometimes it's the language these scriptures are written in ancient languages some are in old sanskrit some are in modern sanskrit the translations were poor because the translators were very academic people who had no real experiences themselves didn't come from a tradition or a lineage so the translations are poor a lot of misunderstanding there or the ones reading it that is those who are seekers they misunderstand because they are reading this through their own conditioned mind as i mentioned earlier you take a book and same book somebody says it's wonderful and the other person says this is terrible so we interpret whatever the scriptures say to suit ourselves and that is why the need for a teacher merely having access to to scriptures or books is not sufficient they are good maps but imagine you are in a new town would you rather use a map even google or whatever your mobile or would you rather have somebody who is a native of that town who really knows that town take you around and show you around but it's very clear the person who knows his way around can give you a completely different perspective to a new town and so a teacher who has been that way before who has done this who understands the pitfalls of the inner, inner journey who can guide you safely through is very important so scriptures alone cannot guide us so we need to ask sometimes need to ask for help when you have done the reading you have you have done a bit of validation through scriptures you reach a point where you're struggling and you say hey i have no clue how to continue i need help that's when you start looking for a teacher and i answered that before that sometimes it's just by trial and error you go through different you go to different teachers different traditions even different religions completely different approaches and find the person who who resonates with you finds the 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 teachings that resonate with you then comes of course the discipline or self effort there are people who are very fatalistic and they they surrender to deities or make ritual offerings but when you give up that kind of superstition there are people who do this also with teachers by the way they come to teachers and they ask oh give me this give me that as if merely give me blessings as if blessings will make all your suffering disappear to change your karma to be free from this bondage you need to have a teacher and scriptures but don't think that the teacher can do your job for you the teacher cannot just externally give you something like shakti pat this idea that the teacher can just transfer his knowledge to you and solve all your problems remove all your obstacles give you some magic mantra which will just change everything this is highly unrealistic this is not possible it's like a superstition instead of going to offer ritual offerings to to deities or you you do it with teachers it's it's not different it's the same thing it's external so we need to work on ourselves and learn negative thinking patterns behavioral patterns and start seeing things more clearly <clears throat> so that we can
practice, put in effort to purifying our samskaras so that we can attain self-realization, freedom from suffering. There is a fourth, it's mentioned as a kind of an effort, but it's not in fact an effort, and that is grace. You have the grace of the scriptures, that's knowledge and learning. You have grace of the guru, which is guidance and instruction. You have grace of self, that is self-effort and discipline. And you have grace of the divine. When these three are present, then the fourth comes to you. If these three are not present, do not expect grace. So all those people who want, who run and they pay thousand dollars for a seminar uh, to get Shakti part from some, some famous teacher or uh, go, uh, go to all possible teachers and ask for their blessings. They should remember this, that without these three, the fourth is not possible. So this leads us to the question, well, not everybody has adhikar, not everybody has had very deep, intense spiritual insights, not everybody has a very sharp buddhi, can distinguish between right and wrong, between ignorance and, and knowledge. So not everyone is an adhikari. Does that mean that those who are not adhikaris cannot go to a teacher, cannot put in some effort? No. Even these people can go and acquire this knowledge. You can begin with basic understanding of the scriptures, you can get basic guidance and instruction. But it is important to prepare the foundation. This approach of preparing the foundation was in fact a Vedic approach, a Vedic lifestyle. The actual practice to be free oneself from suffering is tantric approach. So what has happened in modern times is that due to the high standard of education today, we find more and more people asking questions like, how do I free myself from suffering? These are important questions. What is the purpose of life? What is the nature of being? What is the nature of the world? And however, we find an imbalance because while the person is asking questions of a tantric order, he has not prepared the foundation, which is the Vedic lifestyle. Because a Vedic lifestyle in today's times seems to be almost impossible. However, there are ways we can regulate our lifestyle <clears throat> so that it does not disturb us. So that it does not disturb us and that we can prepare for the tantric practice, which is the inner journey. For this, it's absolutely necessary to understand how our primitive urges impact lifestyle and spiritual development. Primitive urges, all of us have them, Sexuality, food, sleep, and self-preservation. These urges must be skillfully regulated so that the pranic energy is not dissipated. So that the pranic energy is channelized, will bring success and happiness in every aspect of your life.
success also in terms of not just external success but success in terms of practice and attainment of higher states of consciousness questions so far comments thoughts Okay, I don't think I have missed anything on the chat, so I will continue. In the following sessions, we will go into detail with each of these four primitive urges. It is important because it prepares the foundation. I do have people who tell me, oh, I'm okay and everything is fine and I, I'm prepared for advanced practices and can you give me this initiation and can you give me that practice? And I have found almost always that work, a lot of work needs to be done in terms of lifestyle. The very first that we're talking about is sexuality. Regulating sexuality does not mean you have to become a celibate. This is a big misunderstanding because it is true that in most religions of the world, higher teachings are the privilege of monks and nuns. This is not the case in the Indian tradition of Sanatan Dharma, where even householders can be initiated in the highest practices. In fact, some of the greatest sages who have written the Upanishads and the, the Vedas were all householders. The tradition of renunciation was not really ever a part of the of Sanatan Dharma. That was coming from the Buddhist tradition, uh, Buddhist Buddha Buddha Dharma, which of course emerged out of Sanatan Dharma. In the Indian tradition. Sannyas or renunciation is the very last phase of life. It is the fourth ashram. There are four phases or ashrams they are called. The first is Brahmacharya, which is the first 25 years of your life where you are learning, growing, developing. It's of great interest to me that I read recently in a science magazine which says that that scientists, neurologists have, who have been studying the brain have come to the conclusion that the brain continues to develop until the person is around 25. That the early idea that the, the body was physically mature by around 16 or 18 is not true. It is sexually mature around 16 and 18, around between 16 and 18, but it is not mature in terms of the development of the brain. So it's only around the age of 25 that you are fully developed. And so it was a matter of interest to me because that coincides perfectly with the idea of ashrams. The first 25 years of life are about self-development, growth, character, personality development, knowledge, 
acquiring a profession, all these, with a great deal of focus on character development. The second phase is a householder. The third is known as Vanaprastashram, which means somebody who is preparing to give back to society. So leading a quiet life that is serving society. Those who have learned a lot, are very experienced, they give back to the young ones. And only when these people are no longer able to serve, do they take sannyas. But they have lived the first three phases in a Vedic lifestyle, in nature, in living in harmony and in sync with nature. <clears throat> having active lives, being physically healthy, having high moral, ethical standards. So, this idea of celibacy has never been really a part of Sanatana Dharma and therefore regulating sexuality is definitely not about celibacy. A promiscuous lifestyle, on the other hand, can be just as harmful as suppressed sexuality. So both extremes are harmful. They create a great deal of tension in the body. They are creating a lot of tension in the pranic vehicles. And both excessive indulgence as well as suppression will cause disturbance in the pranic vehicles. So having a deeper relationship based on mutual respect with a partner goes a long way towards maintaining physical as well as mental health. Food and sleep are the grosser aspects of urges, of the primitive urges, since they are not required for the immediate maintenance of the body. Oh, sorry, uh, since they are required for the immediate maintenance of the body. But if you think about this, if you contemplate on it, you will realize that the sexual urge is also deeply connected to the most powerful of all primitive urges, which is self-preservation. While the sexual urge is not something that we need, like food or sleep, we can fast for even up to a month. You, you can, but you cannot do more than that. Fasting over a month means really weakening the body. Sleep is even more deeply connected to the body. If you go one entire night without sleeping, you're going to start hallucinating the next day. You need to at least have two to three hours of deep sleep. The sexual urge, on the other hand, there are people who have been celibates their entire life. So it would lead us to think that sexuality is not all that powerful. But in fact, sexuality is very powerful because it is connected to the deepest of all primitive urges, which is self-preservation. It has been ingrained in us so that we have offspring and ensure that humanity does not die out. So, it's very natural that the sexual urge manifests most strongly when the body is mature, healthy, is capable of childbearing and child raising. This desire for sexual union is the external manifestation of the natural desire for us to merge with the eternal. That union, what we desire is also the union of the individual self with the universal self. <clears throat> In our modern society, the sexual urge has been highly distorted. It's associated with shame, with secrecy, with taboo. 
And this is one of the reasons which makes it all the more important that we see the sexual urge just as another appetite. We need not exaggerate this urge in any way. Just as you experience hunger for food, we also experience sexual desire. We have sexual appetite. It has happened a couple of times that people express a great deal of surprise when I have suggested that the sexual appetite is very similar to the appetite for food. And if you can regulate food habits through regular intake of meals, why is it that we find it strange to do the same for sexual appetite? Sexuality, too, can be satisfied on a regular basis, two to four times a week with a steady partner. This has many advantages. Both the partners are then mentally, physically prepared and they take the time to enjoy each other's company with respect. And of course I have been told, but where is the passion? This all seems somehow set up. And I think that taking away that certain passion what people call passion, in fact, makes it more special because you approach each other and it's, it's more normal. It's just simply normal. It can be transformed from a mere physical need to something which is more respectful. It's considered company, it's companionship, it's love. And it's, it, it can be just beautiful time you spend together with your partner. So some points to remember here is when regulating sexuality, it is preferred to have a single intimate partner for various reasons. Um, mental, physical hygiene being also part of that. Promote a healthy relationship based on mutual respect, participation in each other's life. It's not merely about sexuality then. And maintain regular days and times for sexual union, just like you would with food. <clears throat> I have students who have done this and are very happy with this. There are others who have said, no, this was not for us. People are different, have different approaches. This practice um, of maintaining or uh, regulating sexuality is very useful for those who wish to regulate their uh, sexual urges and learn to manage their pranic energies. Any questions about this last topic? Hello, Radhika Ji. Yeah, hi. This is Anisha. Yeah, hi, Anisha. I was just wondering, so this um, discussion is with respect to this you know, someone having a partner. Yeah. I wanted, I, we may not have time for it today, so in the event that you were revisiting, or, you know, going, as you said, into every topic, yeah. I would be interested in knowing what um, you would say for, for someone who might not have a partner, or, um, yeah, I think that's sufficient enough. Yeah. Yes, of course, that is more difficult. And... Um... <laughs> well, the solution in India was that they married off the kids very early, <laughs> which is not possible, of course, in our modern times, which makes this uh, 
of course, a difficult situation. I cannot claim to have any easy solution for that. It's something that um, one can have a private discussion with the teacher, um, but not something that I would like to discuss on this platform. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So if there are no more questions, we can stop our session here. And we will continue then next time with the subject of food. Food being food, it's going to be slightly longer and I'm sure there will be more questions. So perhaps we maybe even need an entire session on food. We'll see how that goes. It's... Um, Food is always complicated. All right, so see you next Friday. Have a nice weekend, everybody. It's nice having you again back online. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank bye, you. Manisha. Happy New Year. Same to you, Manisha. Bye, bye, Mita. Mysuri. Bye, Suvert. Bye, Jan, Beth, Shibu. Bye-bye, everyone.